we now come to the last session of fiesta america 2021 we are right now in the middle of a pandemic it has been a year since covid-19 has become a part of our lives and we are only learning about this infinitesimally small organism which has managed to disrupt the world as we know it we have been talking about pre covid syndromes the various manifestations of covid and long term covid syndromes ongoing covid syndromes post covid syndromes as each day passes we are learning much more about this organism and to talk about one aspect of this chimera we have with us dr arvind arvind is a alumnus dr. of the right. department of medical college and dr right. sajit will be chairing this session so i request dr sajit to please begin this session thank you uh, thank you dr sivan uh, dr sangamitra and the whole team for uh, selecting this topic in the first instance and also for giving us an opportunity to represent uh, the point of view from the infection uh, department regarding this particular issue uh, uh, as you all know dr adavind is going to talk about uh, the covid and post covid issues so i am not going to discuss anything about the topic as such right dr adavind who has been our student for his post graduation in md medicine he uh, is a graduate of uh, alp medical college and after that uh, he has been uh, Uh, i must say handling the infectious disease department in the uh, uh, in the most important medical college to under medical college for the last many years uh, he has also been a part of uh, antibiotic stewardship program at various uh, institutions at the national level had his uh, certification from dundee school uh, in scotland uh, and uh, uh, above all for the last few uh, months you must have been seeing how arvind has been involved in the Uh, management issues and protocols and guidelines related to covid uh, for the state uh, and he has always been a, a source of inspiration to all the young scientists and young doctors working in this field of covid uh, i had the opportunity to uh, listen to dr arvind on at least three or four occasions and he is an excellent orator and he is a good communicator uh, so in him uh, I, i expect a, a beautiful discussion about uh, covid and related issues as all of us know uh you know the issues about covid has been changing day by day and as you and rightly said uh aravind is the right person to discuss about that uh, in our scenario uh i know the time is running out uh, over to dr aravind please uh, good evening uh, thank you sir sir for the the kind words i would like to thank uh, sangamitra madam for uh, giving me this opportunity i am extremely humbled and privileged uh, uh, to have got this opportunity to come to my alma mater where i know the daniel semi majority of the speakers uh, as well as the chairpersons have been my teachers and mentors and uh, some of the uh, of them have been my students like cyril so i'll uh, go to the topic uh, proper uh, shall i share my slides okay. yes sir yes sir you can Are the slides uh, visible? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, as uh, Swain Madam uh, mentioned, uh, uh, I will be talking on the ongoing COVID syndromes. Uh, the state advisory is uh, with regard to the post-COVID syndrome, but then uh, recently there has been a terminology change. So we have all been confused regarding what is appropriate term. Sh should it be a long COVID syndrome or should it be a post-COVID syndrome or, or should, it be, should it be an ongoing COVID syndrome? we know that initially uh, the whatever you know the, the manifestations the patient had after apparent recovery was uh, you know brought under the umbrella of long covid syndrome it was a term which was coined by the patients uh, in whatsapp groups uh, because some patients that uh, did experience symptoms uh, even months after apparent recovery then the ids as well as who came out with the term post covid syndrome where they you know classified it into acute and chronic post covid syndrome acute post covid syndrome being the the multi system myriad manifestations Uh, with the patient's experience after 21 days from the symptom onset and uh, in majority of the studies around 10% per, of the patients did have this acute post covid syndrome and chronic post covid syndrome was used to describe the situation where the patients had these manifestations around 
three months after the initial symptom onset and around 2% had these symptoms this 10% and 2% actually depends on uh, the the patients which which have been included in the study suppose in the west and all majority of the admitted patients will be uh, I mean, hypoxic so in such uh, situations you know the the percentage of patients having this uh, post covid symptoms will be more than maybe around 50 to 60 percentage if you look at uh, the entire population it may be around 10 percentage and recently the nice did change the guidelines uh, and now the terminology which is accepted across the world is ongoing covid syndrome and we are all familiar with this uh, chart even though the state does the uh, the rapid antigen test on day 10 or day 14 so it is not to say that the patient has recovered from the disease it's just to say whether the patient is still infectious because in, we can see that uh, in from this chart the mild severity covid 19 may take around say 14 days for recovery whereas in severe disease it may take around 3 to 6 weeks for complete recovery and this is the recent nice guidelines published in december so they have actually uh, defined acute covid 19 as signs and symptoms of covid 19 lasting up to 1 month from symptom onset and ongoing symptomatic covid-19 as signs and symptoms lasting for one month to three month after symptom onset and post covid syndrome as signs and symptoms that develop during or after infection consistent with covid-19 and which lasts for more than three months from the symptom onset so what is the reason why uh, you know some patients go on to have this lingering symptoms for uh, weeks to months after uh, this disease onset so this has been uh, described as a domino effect or uh what you call as the hit and run phenomena whereas just uh, this virus this is the first one week or so the patient will be having this viral replication which will set in the motion a chain of events at the molecular levels which can account for the severe manifestations in covid-19 as well as what we term as the ongoing covid syndromes uh, which is a multi system manifestations so basically uh, you know the the viral replication can trigger immune dysregulation it can lead to induced susceptibility endotheliitis it can lead to immune thromboinflammation activation of coagulation cascade which can lead to micro as well as macro vascular thrombosis which can even occur so weeks to months after the initial in insult and there is a recent paper from uh, ail university in the preprint form where they have actually identified the diverse functional auto antibodies in patients with covid-19 as being the cause for uh, in the severe manifestations of covid-19 as well as the reason why some of the patients are experiencing these symptoms for weeks or months together they used a unique platform known as the reeb that is uh, a rapid extra cellular antigen profiling whereas uh, where they identify auto identified auto antibodies against 2770 extra cellular antigens so basically uh, this paper says that the rogue antibodies or the dysregulated immune response which might uh, result in immune exhaustion is probably the reason for the multi system involvement or the severity as well as the reason why some patients can may progress to uh the this post covid syndrome and everyone is familiar with this chart from the nature this we also should know when we are approaching a patient who is presenting to you uh maybe weeks or months after the initial covid 19 we know that the receptor binding domain or the in the spike protein will bind to the ac2 receptor and there is internalization of the ac2 receptor the ac2 receptor is present not only in the uh in the type 2 pneumocytes it is also present in uh, the other systems like the the cardiac myocytes the hepatobiliary system the proximal tubules the endothelium as well as the blood brain barrier so we need to know that there is a uh, the procoagulant scenario or milieu in uh, the in patients with covid-19 infection so patients might present with uh, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary thromboembolism or catheter related thrombosis and in the cardiac system uh, the you know the cardiac myocyte as well as the conduction system may be affected and patients can develop this uh, the myocardial injury or myocardial infarction can present with cardiac arrhythmias cardiogenic shock acute coronary nail or uh, tachycardia cardiomyopathy the endocrine axis we know ac2 expression as well as the tmbr ss2 expression is there and you can have you know dysglycemia as well as diabetic ketoacidosis even in patients without uh, pre existing diabetes they can have dysglycemia due to the virus per se and the dermatological manifestations uh, are also pretty robust and we had an interesting case where you know a patient with no history of allergy in the past a sister present with recurrent episodes of angioedema and arterial vasculitis one month after developing the covid-19 and she she is still on covid-19 she is still on steroids now and regarding the neurological manifestations can be dur occur during the acute phase and also can occur so weeks after the apparent recovery is uh, due to the uh, it can either be due to the uh in the uh, the virus uh, binding to ac2 receptor in the in the blood brain barrier or due to cytokines crossing over 
and patients can present with encephalopathy, encephalitis, uh, demyelination, anosmia, stroke syndromes, etc. The renal aspect are uh, usually is seen during the acute phase, proteinuria, hematuria, hepatic, transaminitis, and rarely GI manifestations. And this is one study which actually looked at the symptomatology in patients with ongoing COVID syndromes, the non-specific symptoms basically. Around 55 percentage had fatigability, around 42 percentage had this exertional dyspnea, around 34 percentage had this acute or short-term memory loss. All these things are reversible. Then sleep disorder, which was present in around 30 percentage of individuals. And uh, uh, recently it has been, uh, a, a recent, uh, an article in the sleep journal said that the maximum loss which had occurred due to COVID-19 across the world has been uh, in, in, in the loss of sleep to the patients who are apparently recovered. And they have coined the term COVID insomnia to uh, describe this uh, the lack of quality of sleep in patients who are apparently recovered. And then impairment in concentration, which has been uh, described as uh, brain fogging or brain fading, has been described in 28% of the patients. And uh, we are having apparently one of the largest uh, post-COVID registries in, in uh, Trivandrum Medical College, just looking at the healthcare workers. So we had around say, 900 healthcare worker related infection right from the, the start of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, uh, you can see that around 2% of the healthcare workers. This is important because usually we are, ex we are expecting more of this post-COVID symptoms or symptomatology in patients who had severe disease. Healthcare workers, uh, they are not having that much of comorbidities. Majority of them are very healthy people. Majority of them did have only the mild uh, disease with mild severity. So even in patients with mild severity, around 2% had depression, 10% had anxiety, the brain fogging or fading or environment in their concentration in 10%, uh, arthralgia in 10%, headache in 15%, which can actually trigger vascular headache, myalgia in 15%, excessive hair loss in 20%, altered sleep rhythm in 24%, and uh, exertional breathlessness in 13%, and excessive fatigability in 60%. This is from our healthcare worker cohort. And recently we had this publication uh, in Lancet, it's from Wuhan, they did a six month uh, a prospective follow-up study in around say 2,500 patients. And the major findings in this study were at, at six months of acute infection, COVID-19 survivors were mainly troubled with fatigue or muscular weakness and uh, sleep difficulties, anxiety or depression. And patients who were more severely ill uh, during their hospital stay had more severe impaired pulmonary diffusion capacities and abnormal chest imaging manifestations and should be the main target population for intervention of long-term recovery. So this study showed that at uh, even after six months, around 63 percentage are disfatigability, especially in those patients who required ventilation and all. Sleep disturbance in 26 percentage, hair loss in 22 percentage, anosmia or parosmia in 11 percentage, that actually persists up to six months, then palpitation and arthritis in six percentage. And uh, this is uh, uh, this from the same study, they looked at the the uh, divided the, the patients into three groups. That is those patients who never required this uh, supplemental oxygen, those patients who required supplemental oxygen and another group which required around HFNO, NIV or uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. So as the disease severity is more, the chance of them having this persistent symptoms for a longer period of time is definitely there. And this study showed that the diffusion capacity uh, was actually lesser by 22 percentage in those patients who uh, never required oxygen, 29 percentage in those who required supplemental oxygen and who required ventilation, 56 percentage, even after six months. And the commonest, uh, the radiological abnormality which was persisting up to six months was the ground glass opacities and the irregular lines which suggest this fibrosis was uh, present in around 11 percentage of individuals who never required oxygen, 15 percentage who required supplemental oxygen, 24 percentage who required uh, NIV or HFNO or this thing. So, uh, to, uh, in short, the ongoing COVID syndrome is a multi-system involvement. The cardiovascular system, we need to look at palpitation, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, or cardiac failure. The respiratory system, we need to look at fibrosis, pH, pulmonary embolism. Nervous system, we have some uh, unique symptoms like anosmia, stroke syndromes, short-term memory loss, reduced attention span, confusion, poor quality of sleep, cognitive impairment, cognitive blunting, referred to as brain fogging. The mental health aspect is also pretty important. The patients can present with anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and sleep disturbances. And the muscular system, uh, skeletal system, the polyarthralgia, polyarthritis, myalgia, excessive fatigability, and some patients can progress to this chronic fatigue syndrome, just like uh, following this uh, infectious mononucleosis. This COVID can also trigger chronic fatigue syndrome where you know, the patients will have excessive fatigability following physical, emotional, or mental exertion.
and uh, some patients uh, do uh, uh, develop this uh, interesting uh, features like say uh, orthostatic hypotension or pores that is uh, <coughs> the orthostatic uh, <coughs> uh, postural tachycardia syndromes some patients after recovery on walking may develop uh, abrupt onset of excessive sweating etc and uh, uh, this has been explained some patients also uh, complain of this neuralgic sort of pain as what we experience after herpetic neuro uh, after herpes herpetic neuralgia like pain so the explanation for is this is actually due to the presence of this ac2 receptor in the dorsal root ganglion especially in the the thoracic lumbar region so we know that an early sign of infection is anosmia uh, as well as uh, dysthesia and chemostasis this chemostasis is actually the 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 sensor chemical sensation which is perceived by the taste buds this is the first uh, the aspect of the taste uh, sensation to be lost chemostasis is the sensation of uh, 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 we are experiencing when we are taking menthol and all okay so uh, this anosmia is apparently due to the affection of the sustentacular cell that is supporting cells have this ac2 receptor so the olfactory epithelium is peeled off and uh, the time taken for this olfactory epithelium to grow back may be say weeks or months and uh, sometimes the patient during this recovery may develop parosmia as well so basically uh, this uh, study which was published in pain shows that the dorsal root ganglia expresses ac2 and even if the patient present with autonomic manifestation or pores syndrome or say herpetic neuralgia like neurologic pain probably the reason is due to the expression of this ac2 receptor in the dorsal root ganglia so all the constellation of symptoms have been uh, grouped into four clinical syndromes by uk nihr so one is the classical post critical illness syndrome we know that any patient in the icu they may develop this critical illness uh, polyneuropathy or myopathy so that is uh, applicable to those patients in the icu uh, following this sars cov2 infection as well the second is the post viral fatigue syndrome the chronic uh, fatigue syndrome and all those things third is a lasting organ damage some patients you know after bronchial pneumonia can go into fibrosis some patients uh, after myocarditis can go into uh, covid associated cardiac failure and all the fourth one is the interesting one that is the fluctuating symptoms with slow recovery that is we have had patients you know complain of this the triggering of the vascular headache after recovery and then after sometimes they will complain of this articular vasculitis sort of thing and sometimes they will complain of plantar fasciitis so this is also a very interesting aspect and then uh, the 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 <laughs> the the progression of this uh, the bronchial pneumonia or ground glassing to the fibrosis has been uh, referred to as this uh, post covid ild and it sometimes has been referred to as a tsunami that follows the earthquake so this is basically the pathophysiology we know that uh, in the sars cov2 infection uh, the, the the spike protein will bind to the ac2 receptor this will lead to a down regulation of the ac2 receptor and ac2 receptor actually is uh, protective of, uh, against this lung inflammation and uh, fibrosis so when the ac2 receptor down regulation occurs occurs that angiotensin 2 levels increase and angiotensin 2 is not only a vaso uh, a constrictor peptide it can also drive lung inflammation and can promote this lung fibrosis by activation of the cytokine cascade like il1 il6 as well as it can induce the expression of this transforming growth factor beta when the the tgf beta levels increases it will result in the proliferation uh, the migration as well as differentiation of this fibroblast into myofibroblast and this can result in the accumulation of collagen and the fibronectin so this lung fibrosis is actually also contributed by the ventilator associated lung injury as well as the 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 insult due to the excess of oxygen use so this is actually the pathophysiology of lung fibrosis and who are the patients who are likely to progress from this pneumonia to lung fibrosis those are the patients uh, are the elderly the those with increased disease severity we know that uh, from the classical ards model if the the disease persists for around say uh, one week the chance of fibrosis is 4 percentage in case of ards if the the ards persists for say around 1 to 3 weeks the chance of fibrosis is 24 percentage and if ards in icu stay persists for more than Three weeks, the chance of fibrosis is around 60 percent. The chance of progression to lung fibrosis is more in smokers and also in those with pre-existing lung disease. So these are the, the risk categories that we must be very careful about. And then this is the natural history of post-COVID fibrosis. So the natural history shows that in majority of the patients, the lung, the lung fibrosis uh, does not require any specific intervention. And in some patients, uh, this fibrosis will be static. And then in a in a very small subset of patients it can be a progressive fibrosis and this group should be identified because this is the group those group with progressive fibrosis with hypoxemia this is the group which is likely to uh, may, may require anti fibrotic drugs like say nidotinib or 
carfenetone, even though they do not have that much of indication, this is the group where in addition to steroids, the addition of antifibrotic drug may be helpful. That is in those with progressive fibrosis with hypoxemia. And the other organ uh, which uh, may have evidence of lingering uh, damage is the heart. So along with the lung, the heart may also be affected. And this is a recent study which was published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, that is the, the imaging division. The study was done in the, the college student athletes who had this uh, mild disease severity. So the overall group, the pericarditis, this study was done using cardiac uh, MR so, or the cardiac MR imaging was done as well as uh, the, uh, you know, a particular type of echo known as speckle uh, uh, tracing echo. So uh, they found that the overall group, the pericarditis was there in 27 percentage after recovery. The myocardial involvement was there in 16 percentage and myopericardial involvement was there in 12 percentage. The symptomatic group, 14 percentage, 16 percentage, even in asymptomatic healthy athletes, pericardial involvement was there in 12 percentage and myopericardial involvement was there in 6 percent. So even in asymptomatic individuals, the study shows that six, if you do a cardiac uh, MR, 6 percentage will be having subtle signs of evidence of this myocardial injury. So it may not be, uh, means very important for people like us, for, uh, for whom the levels of exertion may not be uh, very uh, uh, significant. But for professional athletes in the US and all, they now ma uh, mandate that if they had COVID-19 before uh, I mean starting the rigorous training or participating in competitive sports, they need to undergo a cardiac MR to have the fitness. It's very important. So this is how uh, the state approaches ex patients with exertional dyspnea. We need to roll out anemia. So the respiratory cause could be fibrosis or embolism and cardiac uh, problems could be myocarditis, systolic diastolic dysfunction, cardiomyopathy. So we need to, we have the post-COVID clinics and we have stepwise algorithms so that we can identify the cause of exertional dyspnea. And one thing which we should be aware of is uh, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome occurring in children as well as in adults. And majority of the pediatricians are aware of this entity, this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which is actually triggered by the COVID-19 and usually manifest uh, around say three weeks later. It's, uh, the average time is 25 days. That is the COVID uh, triggers an inflammatory cascade and the patient can present with multi-system inflammatory syndrome. The pediatricians are aware of it. In Trivandrum, until now we have had around say 15 cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in adults as well. This is one case. A 23-year-old male present with fever and fatigability of three days duration. The pseudohepatitis syndrome was present. Myocarditis was present. Patient was in hypotension. Saturation was 95 percentage. The COVID antigen test as well as the, the PCR was done negative. The lab investigations were more in favor of a septic shock-like presentation. 25,000 count. Neutrophilia. Thrombocytopenia was there. The BNB very much elevated. The tropical fever workup was done. It was negative. The blood culture was sterile. Echo novitation. D-dimer very much elevated, ferritin very much elevated, CRP, the interleukin-6 as well as the procal levels very much elevated and these were the DDs that we usually consider tropical fever syndrome, septic shock, infective endocarditis and MISA. So we know that we are in such a phase of the pandemic that we should not miss out on the diagnosis of multisystem inflammatory syndrome which is basically a diagnosis of exclusion. So from our experience the only way in which we can pick uh, this, uh, this MISA is that uh, any patient who is presenting you with a septic shock-like thing and if there is a myocarditis, please do roll out multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And young patients without any comorbidities, we are not expecting them to, tropical fever syndrome, yes, but then we are not expecting them to develop a septic shock without a, uh, a foresight to account for the sepsis. And if the inflammatory markers are very much elevated, don't rely on procalcitonin and alone. Procalcitonin can be elevated in uh, MISO also. This is not really specific for bacterial infections. So basically, MISA is a diagnosis of exclusion. So it is should be considered in patients uh, who satisfy all the six criteria, severe illness in people above 21 years of age, a positive test result for evidence of uh, COVID-19 in the last uh, 12 weeks. It need not be a rat or a PCR. It could be an antibody as well. In this case, the antibody was positive. Severe dysfunction of or one or of one or more extrapulmonary organ systems, lab evidence of severe inflammation, and the most important thing is that difference between a severe COVID-19 and MISA is that usually pneumonia won't be there in MISA. The, the, the hypoxemia is due to myocarditis. And it is a diagnosis of exclusion. We need to look at alternate diagnosis like septic shock, tropical fever syndromes, infective endocarditis, autoimmune conditions like SLE, vasculitis, etc. But time is of the essence in young patients presenting with myocarditis and shock in the count. Counts are very much elevated. Think of MISA because the treatment is iodosome either prednisolone. And if there is no response, we have to go for iodosome IVIG as well. 
So this is uh, in the pathophysiology of uh, this MISC in children. So the, the virus to begin with, it may be an asymptomatic or a mildly symptomatic infection. So it can trigger the macrophage uh, activation. So it is basically uh, something like a secondary HLH like thing. There is a cytokine storm and multiple organ systems can be involved and patients can uh, develop this mesentery cardinitis, ileitis, colitis, ascites, etc. So uh, in our 15 patients, some of them did present with acute abdomen like thing and one patient, uh, they, uh, the surgery, the patient present with a 60 year old lady present with acute abdomen hypotension and they opened up the CT or suggestive of say, appendicitis with say uh, ileal thickening and all. They opened, they found that the terminal ileum was uh, inflamed and the nodes were also there. But this cannot, could not explain for the hypotension. The patient had myocarditis, ended up in a ventilator and uh, we suspected this MISA and uh, this, all the inflammatory markers were very much elevated and the antibody was positive and luckily, the PCR was also positive, probably a viral shedding. And the patient was started on high dose of methoprenicillone and we could be in the patient of ventilator. So the terminal ileum thickening uh, as well as the mesentery cardinitis, etc. are also well described in MISA. And uh, this is another thing, uh, the role of this thromboinflammation, the role of anticoagulants. is one of our patients present with uh, three weeks after discharge with uh, loss of vision. And it was a central retinal artery occlusion. And we have multiple patients who are present with uh, the, <coughs> the venous as well as arterial thrombosis. And we, this we know, this is the pathophysiology of CAHA. So we know that AC2 receptor is present in uh, the endothelium as well as there is a procoagulant milieu. So we know when to give the in hypoxic patients a D-dimer elevation, we give this uh, prophylactic or therapeutic anticoagulation. But the problem is confusion is how, how long to continue this thromboprophylaxis. As of now, we don't have uh, evidence apart from those patients who are requiring this thromboprophylaxis for a pulmonary embolism or a DVT. The recent consensus is that if the modified uh, the VTE risk score is more than four, we can actually continue uh, this thing, apixaban or rivaroxaban for so three weeks or four weeks. Or if the improved VTE score is more than two with a D-dimer, which is two times the upper limit of normal. In such patients also, even if there is no evidence of uh, uh, a thrombosis, you can discontinue this uh, thromboprophylaxis for two weeks to three weeks. So there are no definite guidelines. And the factors uh, uh, means which are looked at in this uh, improved risk assessment model is the previous uh, venous thromboembolism, which gets three points, then diagnosed thrombophilia, uh, which gets two points, then uh, lower limb paralysis, which gets two points, the presence of malignancy, two points, immobilization, one point, and stay in ICU, one point, and elderly also get one point. So this is how we should look at patients who may require uh, thromboprophylaxis after discharge. And we need to uh, think about uh, SARS-CoV-2 in patients who present with uh, multi-vessel, large-vessel stroke, Kawasaki-like illness, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, hyperinflammatory shock, toxic shock syndromes, acute MI, guillain barre syndrome, viral encephalitis, atom, olfactory gestative dysfunction, or conjunctivitis. And another thing is that those patients uh, uh, who, are, uh, who develop this bronchopneumonia or an oxygen support in the ICU, etc., after some time, you know, if the patient is having new infiltration, you should also think about some, probably after say 15 days or so, you should also think about the possibility of a COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis or a, uh, or reactivation of tuberculosis, especially uh, in the setting where the steroids are being used or suppose we are using tocilizumab and all, there is always a risk of uh, a reactivation of tuberculosis as well as uh, the risk of COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis. What, should, what will be the clue is, if you look at the, the CT pictures, if there are nodular enhancing lesions along with cavitatory lesions, the nodular enhancing and cavitatory lesions are not very common in, uh, as a part of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So if the patient is not improving, is having fever, nodular uh, infiltrates or uh, patients with the reverse halo sign, uh, with halo sign and uh, the presence of uh, a cavitatory lesions, think about COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis or tuberculosis. So it may not be uh, possible for us to go for a bronchoscopic alveolar bal or go for a CT guided biopsy from this lesion. So what we usually do is uh, we probably may end up uh, starting a treatment empirically based on the radiological findings or probably if the patient can afford, we can go for a serum galactam and testing. And another aspect is uh, the increasing case reports of COVID mucormycosis. We had around say four cases of uh, mucormycosis uh, after COVID-19, all the patients were from uh, uh, Tamil Nadu and they uh, receive high doses of steroids. So you can see that uh, this mucormycosis can also occur following COVID-19. It could be because of the dysglycemia. You know that when the 
the blood sugars are more than say 200 when you are using steroids and all the it's, it's become very difficult to control the blood sugar levels and there is associated neutrophil uh, and the chemotaxic abnormality as well as the intracellular killing abnormality and if the patient ends up in diabetic ketosis the the free iron will increase and when the free iron is in, increase increase the iron permeases or the citropores in the the mucor you know they, they can it's, it's a the virulence will increase and it is an ideal environment for mucor to grow so this is another important aspect if it is present as a rhino uh, orbito cerebral mucor mycosis the things are very easy for us to diagnose you can just uh, go for fs and get the biopsy the problem is if it is present as pulmonary mucor mycosis it becomes very difficult for us we have to look at the radiological findings probably we may mistake it for aspergillosis but then if if you look at the ct picture there is a partial reverse halo sign other clues will be you know if there is evidence of a bronchial invasion that is a bronchial thickening or a peribronchial consolidation or a, a drain bud appearance like central lobular nodules etc it is more in favor of a kappa than mucor mycosis so basically we should keep this in mind and another important aspect which, which we should keep in mind is that usually galactomannan will be negative in uh, mucor mycosis but the problem is if the patient is on piprazidine tazobactam or uh, uh, or selvol active and uh, this uh, the beta lactam antibodies there is a chance of a false positive galactomannan and also if a, if you had started the patient empirically on oriconazole thinking it is aspergillosis there is a chance that the oriconazole can select out for mucor mycosis as well so we should keep in mind and these are the 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 reversible uh, causes of uh, uh, effectibility that we should know about so what is hypothyroidism uh, second is obstructive sleep apnea third is hypoadrenalism and the fourth is uh, the hypovitaminosis d so why we should be looking at because usually when the patient uh, uh, comes to us with a uh, uh, The patient comes to us with a, a chronic fatigue syndrome like manifestations you know we don't have adequate answers for the same but then uh, you know that this uh, in the reason for this uh, the ongoing covid syndrome could be this rogue antibodies so the patient had been on uh, on uh, ha- has been having this hypothyroidism the requirement for this uh, thyroxin may have gone up because there is a thyroiditis involved in the post covid phase because of this rogue antibodies with autoimmune trigger hypoadrenalism if, if it is there it has to be addressed and we know that hypovitaminosis d uh, is associated with covid 19 severity as well as the post covid symptoms that has to be addressed and the important aspect is the obstructive sleep apnea we had a doctor who had a mild covid 19 infection had an apparent recovery his bmi was around 32 but after he resumed his uh, duties that is 20 days after the, uh, the initial symptoms he started uh, means having excessive fatigueability and some sort of a memory disturbance and all and actually the, re, uh, the the problem was the worsening of the underlying obstructive sleep apnea is initial ahi this uh, apnea hypopnea index was only say 10 but after this covid 19 occurred when we repeated the sleep study it was around 26 and he was started on cpap and all his symptoms disappeared so probably it is because of the the muscle uh, deconditioning so diaphragmatic as well as the respiratory muscle deconditioning which usually occurs with covid 19 so these are, are the reversible cause of fatigueability that we should keep in mind and basically the treatment of ongoing covid syndromes uh, include so if it is a, if we are suspecting pulmonary fibrosis go for pulmonary rehabilitation we seek the help of uh, the pulmonologist and the uh, indication for anti fibrotics ongoing uh, ongoing along with steroids the ongoing uh, fibrosis or progressive fibrosis with hypoxemia yeah, the both the drugs the perfidone and ditanib do not have that much of a recommendation to be used in uh, post covid ild so we leave it to the pulmonologist and anticoagulants uh, as per what we already discussed some patients might require anticoagulants even after discharge post covid cardiac failure has to be addressed chronic fatigue syndrome we don't have enough evidence to uh, use any of these drugs try to identify the correctable factors and do that and patients complaining of neurologic pain the usual treatment for the neurologic pain will work so uh, i would like to thank all my teachers and mentors in uh, kota medical college i'm going not going to uh, name any because this quote time what uh, I means so i have learned everything about medicine from quote time medical college thank you very much for this opportunity thank you very much sir thank you dr aravind for that uh, exhaustive and excellent discussion about uh, uh, all the aspects related to post covid and as i am the rightly stressed you know we are still learning on many of these aspects and i'm sure you know as the days will to us and uh, you know to to simulate this with uh, what we had in the field of fx the cd4 cells but subsequently we found that there was no system we just paired 
and all the uh, variations right now are treating various aspects of that particular viral infection. And I am sure, you know, as the days pass by, COVID also will perhaps reach that stage where uh, everybody will start seeing uh, COVID and COVID-related consequences. There is an excellent discussion on uh, post-COVID syndrome or the long COVID syndrome. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, I'll just, uh, you know, summarize those questions so that uh, Aravind can uh, answer them briefly. I know we are running out of time, but we'll uh, try to cope up with that time as quickly as possible. One is uh, related to the persistent uh, investigation results, like uh, troponins, uh, D-dimer, etc., in relation to post-COVID syndromes. So, are we going to uh, treat uh, patients with this uh, high abnormal? Are these results going to be predictive of post-COVID syndrome manifestations? Actually, uh, it's a very difficult to answer this question. I think we have to individualize. We need to look at the risk factors and, uh, for example, just an elevated D-dimer should not be an indication for continuing anticoagulation in these patients. We need to go by the risk scoring system, uh, like the improved VTE score and dot. Because in majority, some patients, the, the abnormal values are persisting for months and the real relevance, we don't know. We have to individualize the treatment decision based on the other risk factors okay. as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, probably, you know, uh, it again, uh, you know, boils down to the summary statement which says don't read the results but read the patients. Sure, sir. Uh, the second uh, question which has come up is, the uh, second question which has come up is regarding the oxygen concentration and the CPL in the lung. The concentration of oxygen in the administered air and the CPL in the lung, are there any relationships between the two? And uh, any way to manage the situation? Yes, sir. Actually, uh, uh, in the pathophysiology, the slide that I had shown, uh, apart from uh, the activation of the TGF beta and the proliferation of the myofibroblasts, the two other factors which contribute to the fibrosis or ongoing lung injury one is the ventilator associated lung injury, and second is the increased concentration of oxygen which is being used for longer periods of time. So, usually the intensivists try to maintain the lowest possible PEEP as well as uh, low tidal volume ventilation, and uh, the inspired plastic pressure is also minimized and the concentration of oxygen administered is also minimized uh, in order to ensure that ongoing lung injury does not occur, sir. Yeah, and there's one question about the fetal risk. Fetal risk as a manifestation of post-COVID syndrome. Fetal, fetal risk. Uh, fetal risk as a manifestation of post-COVID syndrome. Uh, I think uh, the question may be with regard to the, the possibility of vertical transmission and all. So, uh, as of now, we don't have enough evidence to say that vertical transmission is, uh, is really there. But then we recently had a study which was published in Lancet saying that out of 1,000 live birth to COVID positive baby, uh, uh, mothers, around uh, 10 to 12 percent may be, may be having a vertical transmission, but it is not a proof. And regarding the other aspects of how the babies will uh, have and all that, only if the baby gets infected, the chance of a post-COVID symptom and all occurs in babies, which uh, the risk is actually very, very minimal. Okay, very nice. Uh, the issue is, you know, we are still learning about COVID and probably we are going to learn more and more about COVID as the days advance. There are syndromes. Do they, uh, do we have enough information to say that they are going to be different with the new strains? Uh, any such related information? Uh, I don't know, sir, uh, whether, no, it can uh, affect the, the, how the epidemic, the pandemic is going to progress regarding, regarding the ongoing COVID syndromes, whether this, uh, the, the variants under the study, the Brazil variant, UK variant, South yeah. Africa variant, etc. We have, as of now, we don't have any evidence to say that uh, the course may be different. Uh, we have to keep our eyes open, sir. Yeah, probably you now uh, in the last one year only we had learned about this virus and uh, see how it has affected uh, the various systems and how it is going to persistently cause problems. Probably in the next one year we may be able to say whether there will be some change with the new variants and new strains, etc. Thank you, Aravind. That is an excellent presentation. Uh, if anybody wants to ask any other question. Thank you, sir. Any, anybody wants to ask any other question?